well, 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 let's have a look at the recastery. You must be Monsters Review. I am. And you must be Shadow Streak. I am. <laughs> and welcome to <laughs> recast number 55. Welcome. Welcome. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Amethyst? I don't know. You guys why. just like didn't roll with this at all, but that's fine. Uh, so. On today's episode of The Recast, we are going to be talking about Steven Universe, the movie. And also Say Uncle. But first, Shada, how are you doing? Yeah, I've been having a pretty good week, all things considered. I'm actually re-watching Rick and Morty Season 1 uh, with my girlfriend because she has not Ooh. seen Rick and Morty. She's seen like the first three or four episodes, but she hasn't seen that much of it. So I'm watching through that with her. And uh, today we actually watched Rick's D Minutes, which is like my favorite episode. Such a good episode. Oh, yeah. Um, but other than that, yeah, I've been doing pretty well. So I'm pretty pumped to talk about this movie. Nice, nice. Monsters, how you doing? Doing good. Nothing beyond the usual. Same old, same old. Allergy season, again, popping up. I feel like I've mentioned it once or twice on the show before because, you know, we've been through quite a few seasons. But, uh, you know, pollen's in the air. Weather's changing. But we're sticking through it. We're going strong. Here's a, here's a recast challenge. Try to find a time where I ask Monsters how he's doing. He tells me about something like fun and exciting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead of like, oh, I'm tired or it's allergy season. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds about right. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, we had the three of us were on a live stream this past week, in case you didn't know. It was kind of a last minute thing, so we didn't get to properly like fully promote it. But we were on uh, the Ink Tank live stream to get ch get churro get get curro <laughs> churro. <laughs> <laughs> to get, yeah, we were doing uh, an Ink Tank live stream to raise money so that curro could get a churro. Yes, at Disneyland they're way too expensive. Mm -hmm. No, we were we were raising money for so that curro could go out to California and pitch his pilot. Yeah, so that's very exciting. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to tell us all about that when when he's back on. But in the meantime, I don't know where it's... I, I, I assume the stream was archived. Uh, or maybe, I don't think it is. I think he, I think he's keeping it private. Not sure. But basically, the three of us were on, and we each pitched a hypothetical Marvel movie for the next phase. Uh, Monsters pitched uh, basically knockoff Batman, like a dark and gritty parody Marvel movie. I pitched a, a team-up between Deadpool and old man Captain America. And Shadow Streak... Was also there. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I thought mine was a. My gym partner's a Thanos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I pitched. I pitched a movie where Thanos chases a monkey with the Infinity Gauntlet for an hour and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On his farm. Okay. On his farm while he's nude. <laughs> but that's not the only thing we have to plug. Even though you may or may not be able to watch that, I don't know how well a plug it is. Uh, Shadow. Yes. Buddy. Hey. Me and you have been working on something. We have. For a long, long time. Yeah, it's been like two months already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh we're gonna we're gonna release it soon-ish. So over on my Let's Play channel, Pie Guy Plays, starting October 1st, every other day there's going to be a new hour-long video of Shadow and I playing Pokemon. Heck yeah. Woo! But it's not just any Pokemon run. No, not at all. I, I don't think we should tell them specifically what we did. Mm -hmm. But we aren't interested in doing like the usual like, you know, can you beat Pokemon with a Rattata or something like that's been done. A lot of people are doing stuff like that. We're doing uh, challenge races where we hack the game or pick very strange Pokemon or just do weird things. And, and basically it's just... It's a very strange new way to play Pokemon, and if you want to see us having a lot of banter, having some some competitive times, and uh, having fun, the, the first challenge will be started to upload October 1st, and then uploads will continue every other day until that series has run its course. Sounds cool. We're looking forward to you finally getting to see it. So that's over on Pie Guy Plays. I will put a link down in the description, and uh, yeah. Yeah, should be a good time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, we have a Discord server, the Recast Discord server. I don't really have anything like special to say about it this week, but it exists, and there's a link yes. down in the description. Come join the fun. Uh, Monsters, do we have any corrections? 
or observations. I, I edited that. Yeah. So now, because every week we're, you're like, it's not technically a correction, but this is corrections and observations. It's basically just if we if there's something to add on to. Reflecting upon the past cast. Sure, sure. So apparently there's an episode from the Ben 10 reboot called Bounty Ball that does take place on a train. I don't know anything more about it. <laughs> You still don't get the point because I did ask specifically for Ben 10 original, but it is interesting to know that they finally did do a train episode. So there's that. And also someone commented saying that, um, well, Kuro mentioned in the cast that one of the biggest missed opportunities, uh, I guess, of the original Ben 10 or um, not, not, not like the original series, but just kind of like pre reboot Ben 10 was that there was never a time in which multiple Ben 10 thousands interacted with each other. But uh, someone pointed out that technically that's not the case because Eon is a form of Ben 10,000, and I guess they interacted at one point. Well, we saw the episode with Eon and Ben 10,000 interacting. You remember that, Monsters? That was last week. Sorry, I don't remember who Eon is. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Well, <laughs> he's the he's the time traveler that's trying to you eliminate Paradox? all the Bens. The evil one. Oh, the evil one. Okay, yeah. No one considers him to be a Ben because that's a stupid plot twist. So, yeah, that's my response to that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the information. Thank you. Technically, you're correct. And as always, that is the best kind of correct. Yes. So let's talk about the topic that's on everyone's minds and in everyone's hearts. Say uncle. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the episode that got me into Steven Universe. If you don't remember, this is the first video I ever made on Steven Universe was a TV log for this episode. Uh, I was a fan of Uncle Grandpa at the time. And everyone kept telling me good things about Steven Universe. And I was like, yeah, right. I'll check out the crossover. Why not? People are very harsh on this, but to put it in its correct context, it's an April Fool's Day episode. The crew of Steven Universe wanted this crossover. They're they're the ones that, like, pushed for it. Um, it wasn't, like, a Cartoon Network mandate or anything like that. And to be completely fair to it, it, it plays basically, it, like, exactly like an Uncle Grandpa episode with with a Steven Universe flair over it. Like story story wise and just kind of the way things play out and every character is exaggerated. It, it's an Uncle Grandpa episode, really, but it is production coded to Steven Universe. The plot is that Steven is still having trouble with his gem powers. It, this takes place at the very end of season one. It's technically a part of season two, but production wise, the gems all look like their season one design. Steven's struggling with his powers and he wishes that someone would magically come and help him. His mom shows up, except it's Uncle Grandpa. Good morning. Uncle Grandpa takes him on a wonderful journey. The gems try to destroy Uncle Grandpa. And in the end, Steven learns how to, to summon his shield. And since we never see him actually learn to do this anywhere else in the show, that part of it's canon as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I choose to believe all this episode is canon. <laughs> Even though <laughs> canon, it says it's not. <laughs> like the weapon. Because that upsets the most amount of people. And that's really what we're all about here on the recast. Oh, yeah. No, um... Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a very goofy episode, and I, I do 100% understand why anyone wouldn't like this episode, especially because, like I said, they don't they don't really have another episode where Steven figures out his powers. After this, he kind of just knows how to summon his shield inexplicably, even though that was a big struggle for him in season one. Um, so I understand why people don't like it. I don't understand, like, the vitriol. Like, like, people have a burning hatred for it, even though it is essentially an April Fool's Day prank. But, yeah, what, what did you guys think of this? I actually really like this episode. Um, I'm not in that group of people that hates it. I actually think it's quite entertaining. You know, it, it's just like a fun little breather episode. That's what I see it. Like, after the events of season one towards the end, you know, it's like, this is kind of just a nice, you know, let's just settle down, drop the storytelling for a bit, and just have some wacky, cartoony fun. Like, it's not like a mm -hmm. Beach City episode where we're just, you know, helping a person out. No, it's, it's like wacky, zany, crazy fun. And like you said, it's definitely more on the uncle grandpa side of things than the steven universe but like it's not completely unwarranted and i think it actually you know it's fun like i find myself laughing more at this episode than a lot of the regular episodes so like i like it before you say your opinion monsters this episode is actually a good episode to get people interested in the show does it represent like you know exactly what the show is no absolutely not but um it kind of explains like Steven's struggle to learn his powers. It it kind of gives you teases of who these characters are. And it, it just kind of like, it, it, you know, watching the early Steven Universe stuff also doesn't give you a great idea of what the show is. So I'd rather at least have something that's like genuinely funny and kind of like teases me of what this world is. And it, it's very, it's, it's very, um, 
I feel standalone enough that I, I I don't think there's anything that you would be confused about about this particularly monsters. No, there isn't. Aside from who Uncle Grandpa is. <laughs> <laughs> but what did you think? I guess with that, until watching this episode, I'm not joking when I say I completely forgot that Uncle Grandpa existed. <laughs> um, you and I know so many other people. He had a show on Cartoon Network for quite a while, but honestly, I, I kid you not, like, it almost seems like an imaginary figure. Like, it's it, it's like, did he actually exist or not? It's kind of hard for me to remember. Right. But no, I watched this, and it was very much like a refresher of who he was and what his show was about. Honestly, I wasn't a big fan. I think Uncle Grandpa's humor applies to a certain type of person, and that person's not me. There is a lot of fan service and, um, and I guess, uh, a lot of se- self-referential humor. The joke I found the funniest was Amethyst eating Pizza Steve. <laughs> yeah, everyone hates Pizza Steve. Even even fans of the show, myself, he's not a great character. And and it's awesome to see Amethyst eat him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, I understand that the, vi- the, the episode itself doesn't take itself very seriously. And it's not supposed to be uh, consumed very seriously. But kind of like the whole preachy moral thing does seem a little tacked on, in my opinion. It's a parody of how Steven Universe usually is. That is to say, okay. only slightly more exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Stephen talks through his feelings a lot with, with yeah. antagonists. I, I thought it was it was decent. Um, nothing too special. Um, I do find Uncle Grandpa very annoying. But I I actually do like Uncle uh, Uncle Steve. Uh, Pizza Steve and, uh, and Mr. Gus quite a bit. Mr. Gus is great. I got my gem sooner. <laughs> <laughs> it's a frying pan. Yeah. Like, look, I would never rank this in like the top third percentile of Steven Universe episodes. Absolutely not. But yeah, I mean, like you said, uh, Shadow, it's funnier than probably 95% of Steven Universe, to be completely honest. Steven Universe occasionally has really good jokes, but it's not trying to be funny, funny, funny all the time, except for season one. And yeah, I mean, there's tons of jokes, like even just the opening gag about how like, <laughs> Uncle Grandpa was dressed as Rose, which to a lot of people at the time came off, it felt like that was like really inappropriate or whatever. But like, I don't know, dude, it's so over the top that like, how could you possibly find it? Anything other than a joke, you know, like it's clearly right. just, you know, haha, gotcha. You thought it was someone else. Yeah, well, yeah that's how yeah. I interpret it. Like, I know that it, I, I understood that it was like mostly a joke and like, it's it's unbelievably exaggerated. It's just uh, the humor. I I just didn't really click with the humor. That's that's completely fair. I will also point out, in line with me saying this isn't this is more of an Uncle Grandpa episode than anything. There is a point at which we break away from Steven's perspective and see what the gems are doing, like apropos of nothing, which is just kind of amazing. <laughs> like <laughs> here's here's a cut in the show. Woo, and we're we're somewhere where Steven is not the white void. <laughs> I love. I mean, I, one of my favorite jokes is when Garnet's just like, "Okay, I'm I'm ready for this episode to be over now." Like, <laughs> she's just yeah. so done, and I I love Pearl's over. Like, she's such a parody of herself. Motherly, my instincts. baby. That's not my baby. <laughs> <laughs> um. There's also Lars and Sadie are on a ship that is sinking, which is like a like a shipping term, like that their relationship is not going to uh, make it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of subtle, but it's it's really cool. Also, SWAT cats. Yeah, they reference SWAT cats. <laughs> that's that's it's a plus so one in weird. my book. I love SWAT it's, cats. It's like he he Uncle Grandpa references child characters from current shows or shows that were airing at the time, like Clarence. Um, and, you know, classic Cartoon Network shows like Dexter and Dee Dee, and then just out of the blue, it's SWAT Cats. It's like... <laughs> and SWAT Cats wasn't even a Cartoon Network original. It was a Hanna-Barbera show. Are they the Thundercats? Wait, you've never seen SWAT Cats, Radical Squadron? I have That sounds vaguely familiar. I've never seen Basically, it. it's these two cats, and uh, they're jet pilots, and they fight crime in this kind of like... Are they a SWAT team? No. Do they swat at things? Is it, is it like Team Shoot and Ninja Turtles, like that style? Not it's at all. Very, it's it's okay. a 90s show. Yeah, it, it was done at Hanna-Barbera. I, I love it. It's action-packed. It's it's kind of cheesy. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, wonderf- <laughs> wonderfully obscure reference for, for no reason at all. Maybe if Uncle Grandpa had visited Clarence, he wouldn't have gotten canceled. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the only show still there is Steven. Wait, is that true? Clarence is gone. Uncle Grandpa is gone. Yeah. 
Yeah, interesting. And Adventure Time's gone. Was Ben 10 on that list? I feel like he was. I mean, I guess he's in the reboot, re- rebooted form now. I don't believe so. I mean, look, the the episode is unabashedly ridiculous. Like, in structure, too. There's a point where they're just, like, they just go to, like, it, nothing space, and then all of a sudden they're in the Uncle Grandpa RV, and then all of a sudden they're they're back on the beach. Like, it's just... It is just complete like nonsense. And that's what Uncle Grandpa is. Like it, that that's what it's all about. It's 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 a more zany like more zany than SpongeBob, I would say. Yeah, and also I just want to point out, okay, anyone who says say uncle doesn't have anything to do with the Steven Universe movie. Let me just list some things off here. Okay. In both episodes, a literal cartoon character comes out of nowhere to 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 antagonize the Crystal Gems. Okay? Steven has trouble with his powers. A clam reveals a character, okay? Uh, who And there's a character who impersonates Rose in both versions. Lars and Sadie have minor roles. Pearl acts out of character in both versions. And, and, characters are put in false danger by other characters to try to force something. Hmm? Like when Steven tried to force Ruby and Sapphire to, to fuse. Hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> That's deep. Do we have anything else to say about Say Uncle? I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fine crossover, you know? Like, it's not, like, on the level of, like, say, Big Boogie Adventure. Or not Big Boogie Adventure. Uh, Grim Adventures, Grim Adventures of the K&D. Yeah, it's not, like, on that level. But, it, you know, it's fine. It, it's harmless, really. So. I'll say I, I liked Crossover Nexus more. Same. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like that was also a different thing. I mean, yeah. a, a big part of Say Uncle is that it was a huge surprise. Like... They just dropped this on April 1st. And I will also say, of all of the Cartoon Network misleading marketing, uh, I think, say, Uncle favors a lot better than Rocknaldo. <laughs> but that's not saying much. As I stated last week, I picked, say, Uncle mostly just for just for the lulls, just because, say, Uncle is the most cartoony episode up until Steven Universe the movie. And really, Steven Universe the movie references so many things for the show and just flat out retells things like the answer is basically just shown to us again. And so I felt like it it would be wrong to not cover Steven Universe, the movie on the recast because so much of it is about reliving the story of Steven Universe. Steven point blank has a line towards the end of this that it's like, this is the story of my life. Uh, A gem is hunting me down for things that my mother did that I have nothing to do with and the world is in danger and I don't know what to do and can't control my powers. Like, you know, there's another line earlier where Bismuth, Lapis, and Peridot all joke about how they all wanted to kill Steven at a point, uh, which, like, I guess is is true. Uh, Kind of weird that they would have that dialogue. And I don't know that pointing it out makes it less of a problem, but... Yeah, just take a step back. Um, Steven Universe, the movie is a what ninety minute something yeah. like that. It's 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 a it's a it's, it's like a movie. Two minutes. Yeah, is a movie that is about a gem named Spinel coming down and wreaking havoc on the crystal gems, resetting them to their initial states and herself to her initial state. Steven has to try to get their memories back and Spinel's memory back so that he can shut off the giant injector that is poisoning the earth that Spinel brought down. I mean, I don't know why you'd be watching this if you haven't seen the Steven Universe movie, but that's the gist. Spoilers. Yeah, there's no way to talk about the movie without talking about major plot twists and spoilers, so huge warning there. Okay, so I'm actually of two minds on this movie. Really? I love this movie. I think it's amazing. I think it's it's the, probably the best thing to ever come out of Steven Universe. I think it's up there with Ed and Eddie's Big Picture Show. Like, it's in competition with being the best TV movie from Cartoon Network. The action scenes are the best the show has ever been. It's great. The surprises, like uh, Steg and uh, some of the songs and Spinel and, like, all this stuff. Great surprises, great spectacles. The music, the songs are just so Dang good! I've been listening to them on repeat. I, I think just like the 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 emotions, the feelings, everything, like so many parts of this are just so good. And I I like I I've gone back to it to like say, oh, I'm just gonna go watch Spinell's intro scene again, or I'm just gonna go like reference this for you know for for notes for this. And I ended up just watching the movie again because it's it's draws me in so much. But 
Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Is that a hot take I'm detecting? Honestly, no. I'm not even calling this a hot take. Okay. This is just my opinion. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's spicy, I guess. There are issues with the story of the movie, and not just issues within the story, but issues that make the rest of Steven Universe have issues, if that makes sense. I'll get into them when I get into them later. I'll let you guys talk. But I just want to put that out there first, that emotionally... I think this movie is is a, a 10 out of 10, honestly, like on an emotion level, like on a spectacle, on a visual, on a fight scene, on an, all of that stuff. I think that this movie is a huge success. And no matter what gripes I have about the story or anything else, I don't want to let that take away from the fact that I think this movie is a complete triumph. Yeah, I'm in I'm in 100 percent agreement. This is my favorite thing to come out of Steven Universe entirely. 100 percent. I I love this film like I cannot even begin to gush about every single thing I love. Spinell ha- is my favorite Steven Universe character. Like, you know, I, I... She steals the show as both a villain and a hero. Absolutely. Like, 100%. You know, with Steven Universe, like, yeah, I like a lot of the characters, but I never really had that one that I was like, I love this character so much. Definite favorite. Like, yeah, I like Garnet. I like Peridot. I like Lapis. But Spinell is like my favorite character. I I love her. She's amazing, you know, and oh, the music, like you said, is so good. So, so many of those songs slap. They're great. (laughs) They're They're great out of the context of the movie as well. You don't even have to be watching it just to like jam out to them, like Mm -hmm. other friends or drift away or who we are. What was your favorite? Uh, see, that's, that's the question, isn't it? (laughs) Mine's other friends. And then beyond that, um, it was probably going to change like mm-hmm. every time I think about this. But Independent Together is a really good song. Mm-hmm. I'm stuck between Other Friends and Drift Away. I, again, they're both Ooh, Spinell Drift songs. Away. They're both Spinell mm-hmm. songs, but they're so, mm-hmm. so catchy. They have such a great hook into the song. And like, oh, the main refrain just gets stuck with you. And they both yeah. perfectly illustrate they're like in their respective scenes exactly what you know the mood and the tone of the events going on you know other friends is really like wacky goofy crazy jaunty very jaunty yes spontaneous swing song and then drift away is this very like tragic depressing emotional i i should also point out that other friends is one of the very few songs in this movie that doesn't get like any form of reprise Mm -hmm. and yet it's still one of the catchiest and most memorable in the movie absolutely (laughs) absolutely so Oh, man, it's it's a 10 out of 10 for me, too. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Monsters Review. Yes, yes, yes. Don't let us gushing affect you. (laughs) Gushing your toxic purple juice. (laughs) (laughs) Purple flirt. (laughs) You're not in Steven Universe. We don't need to say this a million times, but just to put a frame of mind, I didn't like try to catch you up on the show or like anything like that. I just kind of. I just kind of wanted to see what like a more newcomer person would think of this because personally, I feel like there's a lot in here that obviously there's a lot of fan service, obviously, but I feel like there's also a decent amount in here, like the songs, the animation, the spectacle that can be done, that can be felt without knowing the context, but maybe not. I don't know. What's your honest opinion? All right. Well, I guess I'll also say this. Um, This is almost certainly a hot take. I don't like musicals generally. I'm not much of a musical person overall. Um, I listen to classic rock sometimes, but uh, generally I found most musicals to be kind of corny and overly dramatic, which is, I guess, the overly dramatic part to be intentional, of course. And I grew up around a lot of thespians, so it was it was always tough kind of being on the outside because I never found an interest in it. But with that said... Um, I actually, I really enjoyed most of the music in this. My favorite song was Happily Ever After. Ah, which version? The the initial version. Okay. And if that's telling of anything, my opinion of the movie is, I really enjoyed the exposition, which is not common for most movies. Most of the time, people love the climax or the resolution or the, the big thing at the end. I really like the exposition. Uh, around the time where they start to get into Steg and uh, get into Spinell's backstory was where I started to lose a little bit of interest. And I think the movie ends strong. And okay. I guess this kind of leads into my opinion of Spinell. And that's that I understand why Spinell is the way she is. Uh, I just don't like her as a character. 
and I'm not saying like her character traits are wrong or that she's badly written. As a matter of fact, I think she's greatly written. I just think, and maybe it's just like a personal thing. I just don't like Spinel, and I don't feel bad for her. Can I? Can I ask? Do you not like her overall, or do you not like like good Spinel, evil Spinel? I, I found uh, innocent, good, mindless Spinel to to be kind of irritating, and that that was the point to come off as just overly ridiculous. Um. I, I think I did prefer Evil Spinel, but uh, I I certainly didn't enjoy watching her have an emotional breakdown. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. It, all right. Interesting. Interesting. One thing that I, I do want to really, like, applaud the movie on is its balancing of characters. There are a lot of characters in the Steven Universe. Oh, yeah. A lot of characters in this movie. And... For the most part, with a few minor exceptions, they do a great, great job of, of not having too many of them in a scene at once, you know, and, and flowing between them. The diamonds, you get a lot of them at the very beginning, and then they're out of the movie for a long time, understandably. And then you get a little bit of Connie, and then Connie's out, and then you get Greg, and then Pearl, and, like, you're I- introduced to each one of the gems individually, and then when, after they've been, like, uh, lobotomized they kind of split them up and it's just, it's, it's Ruby and Sapphire that goes with Steven. It's not all of them at once. Uh, and I would say that almost every character gets, uh, something cool to do in the movie. The exceptions would probably be Lapis and Connie. Connie gets to like blade a car in half. Um, <laughs> and also the beginning of the movie kind of gives her an excuse of like, she's not here for a lot of it. So like, I think they did all right with that. I think they did good overall. It would have been great if they could have had every character have a cool moment, but I understand why. I think Lapis gets the absolute, uh, just the the burnt end of the stick or whatever, because I don't, I couldn't even tell you what her personality is based on the movie. <laughs> um, Bismuth gets a uh, gets the focus in that that one song singing about uh, the crystal gems, and you can tell that she's very strong willed yeah. and she's passionate and she's just kind of like a bruiser good motivational speaker and peridot has a lot of like the exposition regarding like she's a technician so she understands the the technology behind the injector and all that so she gets to do that lapis is there (laughs) she saves the the bugs uh the the heaven and earth beetles that's it yeah that's about it (laughs) unfortunately it would have been weird to not have her i guess i mean they don't have like jasper but yeah i I don't really know what there's what there is fixing that i think they did a uh very very good job balancing a lot of the characters and like i didn't even think of like well why doesn't steven call the diamonds like i I don't think of that at any point in the movie there's a line where some where steven's like should i call the diamonds and they're like oh it's up to you if anyone's gonna heal it it's it's gonna be you and there's like plot reasons why he couldn't have just called the diamonds because they can't teleport down so they would have only arrived like literally at the end of the movie like they did at soonest um and also, it's not entirely clear if they would have been able to actually help. And Steven needed to regain the memories of his friends. So, like, even though there is technically these really powerful beings that could have helped Steven out, I think they did also a good job of, like, downplaying that and not making it be, like, a question of, like, Steven, just call the diamonds. They'll be able to fix this easy. Like, the, the movie does a good job of distracting you from that idea. I agree. I agree 100% on that. Hmm. Um, I will say... And I don't know how you feel about monsters since, you know, you're you're not really that familiar with the show. But mm-hmm. it part of me wants to say, don't watch the movie if you haven't kept up with the show, if you want to well, keep up with the show. Because the intro sequence, like, yeah, it's it's so brilliantly well done. But if you haven't watched it, it does ruin a lot of the major plot points of the whole series. Obviously, this is made as a continuation story. It's going to keep going from where the so- show went off. So for... A lot of for some newcomers who might want to check this out. I don't know. I know monsters. You don't really have any interest, anyways. But if there is someone who does, and they end up seeing the movie first, they do yeah. get some things ruined. Which I don't know if that should be held against the movie or not, because really it's more of the fault of the fans or the person watching. So, overarching issues. And again, it's not. I like. I think these are okay in terms of the film, but when you take Steven Universe as a whole. Okay, White Diamond and the other diamonds in the movie are funny, right? Yeah, they're, they're great. They're these overly dramatic, like, like great ants that are like, has your planet always been this filthy? Like, like they're so dramatic and they're so 
over the top and it's great. It's fun. It's comic relief. It's it's good. It's funny. However, I don't know that I can watch the show again and ever take them seriously as any form of threat. Not just not just for like a newcomer, me rewatching the show. Um not just like, oh, well, in the end, Steven reforms them. But now, because like at the end of the series, he reforms them. But now they're just kind of really goofy. And like I said, I think it works for the movie. But I wonder, like, does that really just degrade every antagonist in the show? Well, I, I would at least make the argument that there is a time, a time jump. So that, yeah. that does give them time to kind of develop and get a little more lighthearted and change their ways. It's not like an... It, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. I'm just saying once you've seen these these ultra serious villain characters acting like comedic buffoons, basically, can you take them seriously as an ultimate threat anymore? It White Diamond in Change Your Mind is 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 she's uh she's a monolith. Yeah. She's not even a person, you know? She's she's an institution. And I get why they wanted to do this with her. And I'm not saying it doesn't make sense from the time jump perspective. It does. I'm just saying from a, I'm a viewer. If I go back and watch change your mind, like it's not just that I know that Steven changes her mind. It's that she's goofy. And of course, obviously it is a big spoiler if anyone hasn't seen it, but yeah, uh, it is a continuation. So it's not necessarily meant to be introduction, introductory, even though it kind of is. Um, other issues, and I kind of talked about this a little bit on Twitter, and I'm sorry, monsters, I'm going to alienate you here for a little bit. <laughs> um, alienate. <laughs> Rose Quartz, Pink Diamond. Um, so as the series went on, her character became increasingly grayer and grayer. And th the thing is, I, I think, I think that her character is supposed to be morally gray. That she is a person who did some good things and did some bad things. However, the way this movie paints her, it just like, I don't like her at all. I, I, I don't think, it sucks because it's not even that it's her fault. Like, I don't know that Spinell is her fault. I don't think Pearl is her fault. Like, it's not her fault that Pearl was basically forced to obey her. I don't think she really manipulated Pearl all that much, unless I'm forgetting something, and that's the other issue. Because of the way that information was revealed in this show, out of order, I could be completely missing something about her character because we kind of went backwards with it. Um, so I feel like the movie kind of paints her as a really not good person, as, as a straight villain. And I, and I feel that way because when Spinell is left in the garden, Stephen has a line about, like, I can believe my mom would do something like this. Um... Pearl has a line about how, like, she wasn't truly free with, with Rose around. Uh, Steven has a line about how he was always stuck in her shadow. And these, this, that's not her fault, but, like, it cat, it looks down on, upon her negatively so many times in the movie leading up to the culmination where Steven has that line about, like, oh, there's another gem that wants to kill me thanks to my mom. And it's just kind of like, at a certain point, she, she stops becoming gray and she just... It just feels like she's the ultimate villain in the series and she's allowed to be the villain because we don't have to reform her. We don't have to do anything with her because she's dead. <laughs> and Steven, in, in the show's ideology, everyone has to be reformed, secretly good guys in disguise. But, so so who do you make the villain? Who do you make the cause of this movie? You can't have Spinell be entirely the fault because she's secretly also got to be a good guy. So who do you have? A character who's dead. So it doesn't matter, right? Like, I understand that. And, and I, I think it makes sense within the movie. I'm not saying the movie did it wrong. And I'm not saying just because, again, Steven feeling like he's in his mom's shadow, her, his mom didn't do anything to make that happen. Like, but just because of the way the movie phrases it, and not just the movie, but the end of the show in particular, the last chunk of the show pours on a lot of her more negative attributes. Like she lied to everyone, even past when she had any reason to. She trapped Bismuth in the bubble she she did uh, like all these other things she you know she uh, it, it just i feel like it took what was supposed to be a complex character and made her a villain just for the sake of we cannot have spinel be a true villain we cannot have the diamonds be a true villain everyone has to be secretly a good guy that steven can talk to and make feel better and that's the other thing too the other thing i, I was gonna get to about problems not just in the past but going forward with season six which is most likely a thing 
how are we going to take any villain in the show seriously when they're all just bad guys that Steven needs to talk to to make them feel better and they're all just forgiven no matter what? No matter what happens. How, how do you take that seriously? I understand I understand why Rebecca Sugar and crew want to push this message and want to have a show where everyone can be good. I understand that. There's a lot of shows where it's the opposite morality. And I think we do need shows that encourage kids to talk through their problems and realize that people are more complex than just a villain. But, um, you know, even in the movie, like, Spinell does horrible, horrible things. Greg's arm was, like, completely wrecked. But we don't have consequences of that because Steven can just magically heal that. Steven can magically heal the Earth. We, we don't have any consequences. And so Spinell is allowed to not just, like, go free, not be punished at all for her crimes, but go live in the palace with the, with the diamonds. It's, it's, it's kind of maddening how that ideology is really just pushed so far in the show and the movie. And now they're also going to be more of Steven Universe. How could he be pushed any further? Yeah, um... I think you that's a lot of my issues with Spinel. Um I think I think a lot of her character is cleverly written especially with the kind of I guess the the narrative parallel and the fact that uh she came to earth with a toxic injector when she herself mm-hmm. is a very toxic character mm-hmm. uh, spreading uh I guess emotional toxicity. Um, and everything she does makes sense. You know, after having yeah. to wait several thousand years, I would totally be an emotional roller coaster and be unbelievably upset at, at this and uh, realize that your playmate is gone and uh, all this other stuff. I would, I totally understand where she's coming from. It just wasn't fun for me to watch her go through all these emotions. And I don't know what exactly that was about it, but it just seeing her go through all this stuff was not fun. There was not, I, I didn't feel bad for her. I, I didn't feel, uh, I, I wasn't happy to see her get beat up. It was just like, she was a mess. Well, here's something that's just weird is that we're, we're shown from Spinell's perspective, what happened with pink diamond. Now we, again, she's dead. She's not here to defend herself. So, you know, she looks worse. And thanks to Steven's line, it almost feels like the show really wants to absolve Spinell of her own person, her own responsibility of making herself happy. Um, Because, like, did... Okay, if you want to say that Pink Diamond, like, has the power to make gems obey her, and, like, her, her command to Spinell was a literal command that Spinell could not break, then I think you have more justification of saying that, yeah, she's just a villain, and Spinell's not, you know, innocent in it. Um, but the way it's kind of phrased, it kind of seems like Spinell is a really clingy, annoying friend who would not have allowed Pink to be free. She yeah. would have blown their cover. She would have gotten them in trouble. She would have reported back to the Diamonds or something. She she thre- she was a threat to Pink Diamond's own freedom. And, like, what is the alternative? Was Pink Diamond supposed to stay in that garden with her and, and babysit her for the rest of her life because Spinell's r- happiness is, is you know, uh, Pink's the keeper of that? Like, I don't think that's right. Yeah. Um, sh- could Pink Diamond have handled the situation better? Of course. Of course. But I, I think, really, the way I read it anyway, it looked like she told Spinell that because she expected Spinell to not follow her and then maybe go live her own life. Like, I don't think Pink Diamond literally expected her to stand there for 6,000 years. Again, unless there's a gem power, which we don't know because we didn't see the actual scene. We just saw, like, Spinel recreation. Yeah, and you brought up a really good point earlier, too, with, um, with like, her basically almost destroying the world and not getting any sort of punishment for it. Just, like... No consequence. No consequence. She, she goes up to live with the diamonds and Steven just restores everything automatically. Yeah. And I, I think I think there is something poetic again within the movie of sending her off with the diamonds about like, yes, they grieved Pink Diamond. She's grieving Pink Diamond. It makes sense in, in a sort of um, Mr. Greg kind of way. But I yeah, I do think that it ultimately really is just compl- not like no punishment at all for all the awful things that she did. And I'm not saying that, like, she needs to be destroyed for her crimes, but it's like. Can she have time to reflect, or is it just, well, she's already found someone to love her, so let's go rush into that. Yeah. Base your happiness on others, guys. You know, 
This this is a bit of a stretch, mm. but her character almost reminds me of Barry from Fosters. <laughs> yes, well, she's she's similar. Emotional yeah. backstory, very uh, lots of mixed emotions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and again, I like Spinel. I think Spinel is good. I just kind of feel like. I feel like the show wants to put the blame, the movie wants to put the blame on Rose, and I don't know that Rose is to blame particularly for that for that particular instance. But then again, knowing the other things that Rose did, Pink did, I don't, I don't. Well, know. see, here an argument to be made is the idea that you know was Spinel forced to obey her every command because she was a diamond, like all right. That's gems? what I. That's that's what I was questioning. Like because if if that is the case then i would say it is her fault because she knew yes. that she, you know she was going to tell her to stay there and she spinel was not going to move right but spinel didn't seem to have a problem moving when she found out but that's also because she was gone she was gone for a long time before steve i mean like she got confirmed this message got confirmed that she was dead you know right, like you gone think, gone how do you think such a thing would uh, anyway well maybe there's i mean i don't know maybe there's an unwritten rule that when once the gem disappears <laughs> for eternity you don't have to obey their commands anymore but then again pearl had to so that's a contradiction what am i talking about okay I, <laughs> I see like know. that but that's the thing because the show always wants to be so like vague about rose's perspective because the show's from Steven's perspective, and Steven will never have a first-hand account of his mom. He will never have it. That's always that's like the point of a lot of this. And I get the point of leaving it ambiguous, but I feel like the show didn't do the movie didn't do that. The movie leaned towards, yeah, my mom did that to you. Like Well, Steven much straight so. up says that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, multiple times. So, I mean, that's I think that's a real issue. Uh, but again, like in the beat to beat, when I'm watching the movie, I don't feel like it's ruined for me because of that. It's just something I think about, especially in regards to how the show is as a whole. And yeah, it, it does bum me out that like things like Greg's arm, it's like there's just no consequences. Nothing has lasting. There's a crater. That's that's the consequence. There's a dent in the hill. That's, you know, the Earth got like mega poisoned <laughs> and uh, there's, a, there's a crater. Is it a global warming? <laughs> is it a? Is it like a Captain Planet reference? Here's a. Here's, it's not necessarily a plot hole, and I can forgive it because it. You don't like the flow because of the flow of the movie. But but at the beginning of the movie, when Steven's giving a speech, we see st we see Spinel stuck there, or, or we see her leg. You don't realize it's her at that point, obviously, but you see her there, and so presumably that was the message that she heard on repeat. Somehow. In the span of Steven warping back home and running around with the gems, Spinel found the scythe weapon, the injector, just located Steven, traveled to Earth, and plopped that thing down in the span of gotta be like an hour. Also, you gotta question, like, why did she wait that entire time? Like, as humans, we can't comprehend what, six, what it feels like to live 6,000 years. Well, we just we were just talking about that that we we weren't sure if she is like forced to do that or well, if she can just up and leave. Why why couldn't she have done that earlier? According to Shadow, it's because now she knows the the gem is dead. See, but, that but I make sense. but uh, like I said, that contradicts the whole idea of uh, what was it? Um, Pearl. Pearl, a single yeah. pale rose. Yeah. So and I, even in a single pale work. rose, it's ambiguous as to whether Rose was forcing forcing or whether it was just like this is a deep dark secret. Don't betray me. So it's it's vague. It's very vague. Yeah, and I feel like if it had been a little less vague, it could have made things a little clearer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's times when ambigu ambiguity is good, but when the show doesn't really address it as an ambiguity and it just makes it, well, again, Stephen literally says, thanks, Mom. Um, well, he doesn't literally say that, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's basically like, thanks, Mom. It's just, yeah. Here's a question I had. And this this question is really why I wanted to put this on the recast. And this doesn't have to be specifically... We can answer it to, specifically to Steven Universe, but this is also an open question. At what point is something... It, like, okay, you can look at this movie in two ways. You could see it as the ultimate culmination of Steven Universe. The best of everything the show has to offer. The best storylines they've done. The, the best of the type of music. The best of the type of plot lines. The best of just, like, everything, every idea they've had. Or you could see this as a tired retread that just runs through things that we've seen time and time again on the show. At what point is something a, like, 
you, you know what I mean? At what point is it a di- distillation, a perfect distillation of what the show is? And at what point is it just the, the show can't move on from its original idea? Like, you know what I mean? Like, because I think it, with the Steven Universe movie, I'm in the camp that this movie is just the best of Steven Universe. Like, you know, I don't need to go back and watch the answer because I got the best of the answer from this movie. I don't need to go back and watch, you know, Pearl's backstory because I got the best of that in this. I don't need to go go back and watch On the Run because On the Run is basically recreated in this episode, in this movie. That's the camp I'm in, but a part of me is kind of feeling like, almost like they really did want to hit, like Spinell's backstory is very similar to Pearl's, so much so that what Steven does to jog Pearl's memory is what starts jogging Spinell's memory because it's so similar. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we literally see like a good chunk of the, well, of a reanimated version of the answer, um, with Ruby and Sapphire fusing for the first time. You know what I mean? Like we, we, we see a lot of it. They don't use clips or anything, but a lot of it is just so dependent, not so dependent, but just like, here's the best of the show again. I don't know. What what do you, what do you guys fall? I mean, I, I know monsters, you don't know the show in particular, but as, as I've been saying, like a lot of these things are in the show. Well, I mean, I, not to bring it, I, I guess we are bringing, bringing it back to the fan service thing. Um, the movie is a big deal. Um, maybe it was just to celebrate the show and to, to hit all of those notes. Uh, for, for someone like me, at, who's not as familiar, uh, some of those things did help. Like, I never, I don't remember if I have seen the answer or not. I feel like I have, but... But no, uh, a lot of that stuff did provide context. Uh, but if you're just talking merely about parallels, and I, I guess you wouldn't even call them coincidences, just like characters having the exact same backstory, I don't think that's correct. Mm. I mean, they don't have the exact same, but basically it's like... The same beats. They're foils yeah, to each yeah. other. I mean, to, to me, I think what I definitely know is whatever Steven Universe Season 6 is, it had better be very different. I do not want another plot line that has something to do with what Pink Diamond did years and years and years ago. Never again, please. <laughs> well, do you feel like they're going to keep... Um, do you feel like they're going to keep revisiting Pink Diamond slash Rose Quartz until we have all of the answers? No, no. I, they don't They don't have any intention of telling us, like, a linear timeline of Rose Quartz's life. Like, the, they, they've intentionally been vague about things like the war for so long on the show that it's just not a focus to them. It's just a part of the backstory of the show that they love hinting at, but they never want to line up like exactly the years when X, Y, or Z happened or, you know, they don't, they don't want to go into detail because that's not what the show's about. Yeah, that's really. not right. the point. It's just kind of a setup. It's that. the it's the backstory to the backstory almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so like, yeah, no, I, I, and I don't feel like there is any other possible place they could go with Rose Quartz unless they want to bring her back, which I... I wouldn't doubt it. No, I don't. No, no, no. I don't think they would ever do that, and I, I severely hope they wouldn't. But at a certain point, it's like you've looked into this character, every aspect, her as a diamond, her as a as a quartz, and just all of the things that she's done, mostly bad at this point. I mean, it, it, it makes sense to me because, correct me if I'm wrong, most of the series is about well, not not I, I guess not most of the series, but uh, up until recently. Uh, a lot of the things have been about Steven dealing with, uh, with like, not having a mom and, like, the issues that that's caused to Pearl and his dad Correct. and everyone around and him. him. So yep. wouldn't it make sense for some sort of big penultimate finale to deal with him uh, directly interacting with his mother? Um, it, 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 it would, but Change Your Mind went the opposite route of that. I don't know that I necessarily want to spoil that, but... Uh, after let me just put it this way change your mind had an opportunity to have steven do that and they intentionally chose not to go that route so to do anything else at this point to bring her back in some way although it might be like juicy for story possibilities would completely fly in the face of change your mind Hmm. i love the animation i love the fight scenes i love that spinel comes and fights them with rubber hose animation like yeah that was pretty cool yeah i never would have seen that coming at all um, Steven Universe, the movie was wonderfully, like, not spoiled very much because we had that teaser trailer for a long time that gave us exactly no information aside from a vague, like, outline of the villain and the heart 
Jim. Well, that's the thing. Like, everybody thought that she was going to be, like, Jenny X J9, but... <laughs> but they but, didn't think she literally was... Well, not, not, <laughs> not actually her, but, like, looked like. And I guess that's maybe what, like, evil Spinel looks like, but... At least Happy hmm. Spinel almost reminded me of a Mickey Mouse. I said Mickey Mouse. That was yeah. my take. I didn't say... I was thinking XJ9. I didn't say it. Anyway, yeah. But but luckily, uh, for, for a while, we just had that teaser. And then we did get a little trailer, and that was pretty good. And then we got an amazing Toonami trailer, which, like, hyped the movie but didn't spoil the plot line. I guess, what did you guys think of the, the fact that it is an amnesia plot line? Which is... <laughs> it happens very frequently in fiction. I mean, uh, like uh, like I said, I still got enjoyment out of this, like, even though it was, you know, amnesia. But I don't have an issue with amnesia, personally. There there are other plot lines that I find are more overdone that I'm really, you know, not the biggest fan of. And it really comes down to execution when it comes to this sort of thing. Like, even if the idea is an original, the execution is what truly matters. And I thought that the fact that they they gave each gem you know, their own respective time to kind of like show them as they originally were and then kind of go into them reforming slowly and being inspired by a song and that sort of thing. I, I don't know. I thought it was pretty, pretty well put together, even though I thought it. Yeah, I thought it was a very good take on the amnesia plot line. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And in that it wasn't they also didn't they could have done like a time travel type thing. Uh, I mean, time travels in Steven Universe, although the show kind of forgot about it. Um <laughs> but they didn't it, it is it is all it almost feels like a time travel plot line yeah but in a recreation sort of way um and so i feel like it kind of it kind of merges the best of that and with the amnesia stuff i don't think the character like they they gave the characters interesting things to do right uh amethyst mirrors everything pearl has this really funny like servant like um, Greg Universe, I'm gonna wash your car. Like, <laughs> funny and interesting, Rolls off the red and carpet. it's not exactly like her character in Say Uncle, but it's along the lines of kind of resetting her to a very like shallow version of Pearl. Yeah, um, which is funny because she's a pretty complex character. Uh, and then also Garnet, we get to see Garnet like experiencing herself for the first time and finding whimsy and everything, and that was also very adorable. And I like how they did that. I like how they. Steven, ha it, it felt like Steven really had to work at it. It wasn't like, oh, let's just sing a song and then you're back. Like, that's what happens with Amethyst. But Garnet, he has to get them to fuse. And then he has to also piece them th what, what the other piece was missing with them. And with with uh, Pearl, it takes quite a bit of effort to get her to to disobey Greg. Yeah. And I like that. I feel like they did good. How about the other cliche plot plot thing that this movie does? The The third act misunderstanding. <laughs> Everyone loves the third act misunderstanding. When the hero's getting along and everything's fine, but then, uh-oh, something stupid happens and the characters don't like each other no more. <laughs> in this instance, Spinel, Steven seems to have gotten through to Spinel in the garden. Spinel has gotten her memories back and Spinel's going to help them get rid of the, the thing, the ejector. But then she feels like that's all Steven was using her for and that Steven was going to reset her afterwards, which he wasn't. And then that causes one more fight and all that stuff. I... I'll be honest, I, I think this was a, a decent example of this in the sense that it makes Spinel a little more complex rather than just, I'm going to sing a simple song and then you're just good now. Uh, it it plays on the fact that Spinel is still insecure and has issues, and it's not, it's not just a misunderstanding born out of, like, characters getting angry at each other for no reason. You know, it's the villain character who was kind of reformed and then... Just all it takes is one little thing to push her back over the edge, which I thought makes her more interesting than a lot of the other characters like White Diamond who gets reformed and then they're just they take little convincing and then they're just good guys permanently. So I, I think honestly that misunderstanding is what makes Spinel a better version, a better version of, of the stories that we've heard over and over again on Steven Universe, the villains we've heard over and over again. I guess I'll say that it's common knowledge that it's very difficult for any sort of media to make me to to evoke emotion out of me. But yeah, I I feel like a lot of the things I was getting from this were um just the theme love is the answer. And I feel like that's that's recurrent throughout a lot of Steven Universe. I bet you didn't know this, but love is literally the answer in the answer. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense no, not even kidding <laughs> and um if they hadn't made it clear uh another big thing they were trying to get at is change yeah 
I, I do feel like some of that was very, very on the nose, uh, <laughs> preachy at points. And I, I can say with certainty that I just don't like Ruby and Sapphire. The the over dramatic nature of the two and just the excess of romantic emotion between the two really annoys me. Oh no. <laughs> it's alright. Uh I I really don't want anyone to go after me. This is just my opinion. Is there any particular reason? Would you feel the same way if it was a man and a woman? If it was a man and a woman, I wouldn't feel different. Okay, okay. What what I was also trying to say is that I refrain from using this term, but I feel like a lot of their emotion is very bipolar. Like they're either lovey dovey or they hate each other's guts. Well, to, let's let's also be fair that the only other Ruby Sapphire episode you've seen is Keystone Motel, which is like the example of I that. I think I saw another one too. I don't remember what it was, but yeah, no, I feel like they either love each other or they're having some sort of major argument. And Hit the I, I don't know. Well, I mean, that's all relationships, really. No, sometimes there's an in-between. I don't know, just the back and forth and the constant highs and lows. There's no, there's no, any, there's no level. Garnet is, Garnet is simple, to be, to be quite frank. Compared to um, Amethyst issues, image issues, and, and Pearl's major issues, uh, and even the supporting cast issues, and Stevens and everyone else's, Garnet is simple in the sense that Ruby and Sapphire just love each other. I just, I don't know. I find a little bit of the conflict to be silly because it, it feels like there always has to be conflict and there's never a point where people just seem normal. It feels like there always has to be some some sort of major relationship thing going on. But that's what Garnet is. Garnet is a relationship. That's her entire character. Well, I, I guess, for, again, I guess this kind of ties into my opinion of, of Spinel. I understand why they're written that way and it, that that completely makes sense on paper for me. It's just that... Uh, it's not very entertaining for me to see personally. It's just something okay. I don't enjoy watching. That's fine. Is there a lot of romance in Samurai Jack? <laughs> <laughs> not until season five. Yeah, not till season five. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> and that's that's also a questionable topic, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's just my take. I mean, of the media I consume, a lot of it usually isn't very romantic or uh, or emotional. So. Let me let me ask what sequence. From each of you, which sequence did you find to be the most artistically beautiful? That's a good question. Either the end fight with Steven and Spinell, that was really mm. well done. Either that or um, the happily ever after sequence where they go back to Beach City and they just explore around with the, with I don't even know what it's called, the new development with the windmill and everything, with everyone building. Little Homeworld, I believe they call I it. I just loved all of the establishing shots and I think they did a really good job of showcasing the environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how about you, Shadow? This is a good question because I'm trying to think because there's a lot of there's definitely a lot of like memorable moments for a lot of people. Well, I'm not just saying memorable moments. I'm saying like beauty. Uh, I should say memorable settings. Sorry, because isn't it isn't it love is is one of those. That's when when they first fuse. I mean, I really like independent together and the sequence of them all flying. I think that that's a really like Hmm. just fun sequence. Um, But I will also say unconventionally the opening like the. Yeah. Where the credits are playing. Oh They're, yeah, it's just like a really, really nice stylistic. I don't even know what to like, what style or what to call it. It's like it must uh, been, it's like a simple polygonal construction paper or so, like I, yeah. I don't know, but it's very, very detailed and it's very beautifully colored and it, it, it's like a lot of locations from the show but very kind of reimagined but well yeah. done yes. very colorful so. yes absolutely um i don't know i wouldn't say that's my favorite but i i, I gotta i gotta throw out that so yeah I, I would say probably independent together yeah the more the more you mention it i actually really do remember the intro specifically like sticking with me so i i think i'll actually go with that just because like okay. you said it's got a very signature simplistic style to it and yeah, yeah, I'd definitely say that, actually. It's a very mm. strong opening hook that really sets up the rest of the film. Were there any songs that you guys didn't like? <laughs> I gotta be honest, the the one before Steg, I wasn't that big of a fan of. Disobedient? Yeah. Okay. Any particular reason? It, I don't think it was as catchy as, as the other ones. And How about you, Streak? I will say the first time that I watched through the movie... There wasn't a single song that stuck with me, but that's mostly because when it comes to musicals, I'm not really like listening to the music to like 
get it stuck in my head. I'm paying attention to understand what's going on because with musicals, like, yeah, they're catchy songs, but they're also telling you the plot. They're telling you what's going on. They're progressing the story forward. And whenever I watch a musical the first time around, I'm paying attention to what they're saying and how they're moving. I'm not really paying attention to, you know, the rhythm. I mean, yeah, like it's entertaining, but it's not my focus. I'm more focused on like the visual aspect. So the second time through, that's when all these other, all these songs started really like clicking with me. Like again, like other friends and who we are. I think that's, it's the business song and drift away and all, all of those, like the second time around is when it really like they clicked and there isn't one that like I dislike. I don't dislike this, but I would probably say it's my least favorite. The tale of Steven, the very first song. Oh, I don't think it's awful, but it's not from the diamonds. You mean? Yeah. I like that song. I thought it was okay. That's fair. <laughs> it was very, it seemed very Disney inspired. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's okay. Like, I don't, I don't dislike the song, but if I had to pick a least favorite, it's not Happily Ever After. It's not Let Us Adore You. It's not Steg's song. I, I like Disobedient. I like Pearl's song, the system boot song, hmm. where she like explains everything. Like, you said you like the exposition monsters. Well, I bet you you like that song the most. <laughs> it's an exposition song. <laughs> Isn't it love? Like, I like all that stuff. Actually, ironically, one that I found a little underwhelming was True Kind of Love. Mm. And it's not, like, it's a, it's a good song. It is. It's nowhere near the best song in this movie. And it was the one that was promoted with the movie for well, some reason. Well, it's very reason. poppy. Yeah. But it also has a long break in the middle between Estelle and, and uh, Zach's parts, between Steven and, and Garant's parts, which is kind of weird when you're listening to it. I don't know. Again, I like True Kind of Love. It's not that I don't like it, but it was played a little bit too much beforehand. It was played up and it just, I don't know. I don't feel like it's the song of the movie, to be completely honest. I think maybe like Happily Ever After or Finale. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, uh, oh, yeah, I got to point this out. How did you guys feel about uh, Steven getting Spider-Man powers at the last moment when he needed them? (laughs) Convenient. What was up with him scaling a sheer vertical glass container without his power one thing i I wondered too is when when the injector exploded like nothing happened (laughs) like it just kind of exploded like there was no sort of uh debris or like the juice didn't like spray anywhere and destroy a bunch of stuff that would mean consequences monsters (laughs) yes that would (laughs) have those but yeah no i don't understand why he just like it's supposed to be a really empowering moment of steven climbing this like unclimbable thing and it it's a cool visual, but, like, they couldn't have given, like, little chips in the glass for him to hold on to. They had to make it look like he's literally spider Manning up the wall in flip-flops. <laughs> he's the legendary Steven Universe. There's nothing he can't do. I mean, Steven is known for getting powers out of nowhere. I, I don't think he literally has Spider-Man powers. I'm just, this is just a joke. But, like, yeah. there's no explaining that scene. Like, you, you can't really, other than just, like, Steven's got willpower, yo. <laughs> <laughs> the more that I think about it, like... That that tank of, of toxic fluid was enough to destroy the world in like a day. And it just exploded and nothing happened. I, I, that's still bothering me. <laughs> How about the fact that it's controlled with a bugle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> where did Spinel even get this thing? Like, we know, obviously we know that this is like diamond technology or gem technology. It's not that unusual for it to, to exist, but like... Where did she, how did she know where to find, like, I guess it was one of Pink's and she just, like, it was just lying around, like, they didn't decommission it. It was in their play box. And if they had, if they had this scythe that can reprogram gems, how the heck did the diamonds lose the war? How would you, how could you lose a war when you can reset people? I, I love this movie. I really do. I really do. Like. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Genuinely, my gripes are gripes that I think still kind of matter, but, like, are more logic gripes and not like emotional me enjoying the movie moment to moment gripes um also again gripes that have to do with it fitting in with the rest of the show one oh one neat thing did you guys notice that in the original version when garnet forms it's ruby rushing in to save sapphire but when they're put in danger this time it's sapphire rushing in to save ruby proving that they both love each other equally it wasn't like ruby is the special one that caused garnet to happen they both had that potential. Hmm. That was actually a nice detail. I didn't notice that, but now that you point that out, that's actually really mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. Uh, another really cool thing is, and 
you wouldn't, I don't know. I, I don't know what got me to thinking about this, but when Steven warps to Earth and starts singing about the future, he uses all of his main powers in that whole, throughout that whole sequence. He floats down on his bed. He summons his shield t- when he's talking about his power. He bubbles himself down the stairs. He um, goes in lion to transport himself to Lars. He uses a small bubble to transport some of Lars's ube to save for later, mm-hmm. um, which is a reference. He uses healing spit at the very end of the song to heal the flower that he plucks. And I feel like there might be one more that I'm missing. Those are all like his main powers. There's other powers that he has, like bringing plants to life that he doesn't do. And also body swapping, which the show and everyone would like to pretend that doesn't happen because <laughs> it <laughs> tends to happen in like the worst episodes. But that's fine. But, yeah, no, I thought it was a really cool way to very subtly, very naturally integrate all of Steven's powers. So later in the movie, when Steven can't store the thing in Lion's Mane, when he's having trouble summoning his shield, when he's having trouble with all this other stuff, we understand, even if you, even monsters, even though you don't know Steven's powers extensively, you still kind of subliminally got a glimpse of most of them at the beginning of the film. Yeah. We don't see him fuse either, uh, for some reason, at, at the beginning. Uh, that that could have been cool, but... Well, we got Steg Boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, dude, I love Steg. I, I don't like the name. I think Grieven makes a lot more sense, considering... He's grieving. Yeah. Right. They well they're they're not not anymore, but they oh. both have a dead, you know significant s- significant other or member. mother. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're both they're both missing Rose Quartz in their life. And so Grieven makes sense as a pun in both ways. Steg just sounds really stupid to become Stegosaur. Completely honest. And to be fair, you didn't have to name them like you named Stevani. You could have called them Mr. Universe collectively. Or Mr. Multiverse, I saw it thrown around. Like, there are other options. Steg is is a big loser name. I don't even think they say it. But I love everything else about Steg. I know, uh, I, I can already feel, like, somewhere on the internet there's people, like, talking about how disgusting it is that Steven fused with his dad. But, like, it's just it's just a thing you can do when you're, you're close with someone. It can be more romantic-based, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I mean, like... <laughs> Pearl, Amethyst, and Garnet all fuse with each other, and there's no romance between any of them. Well, not <laughs> okay. if you ask certain okay. parts you of the internet. What? Well, <laughs> but but what I will say is I I will blame the Crooniverse at least partially because they did make a lot of those early fusions kind of provocative dancing. Not to say anything wrong with that, but it does kind of imply that that's you know it has something to do with that. But but yeah, no, I I think I think it makes sense. I thought it was like a a wonderful surprise because. It seemed like Steven was never going to fuse with another human aside from Connie. Like, so good surprise, good use of the character that they needed a way to get rid of Greg so Pearl could be free. And just, yeah, like, I love that his power is that he can make people float, uh, especially <laughs> with the music. And I, lo- I love the design. I love everything. I love the fact that uh, apparently he is the voice actor for him is in a band with the, the voice actors for Opal, who's the other fusion monsters. Um that uh, Amethyst and Pearl form into, who didn't have a speaking line since very early in the show, so it was cute to see them, her, even though she didn't really do much. But it was cute to see them together, and also Pearl playing guitar, Pearl playing guitar at the beginning of it came back in the fact that Opal could play the guitar. Taking a step back, this show serves internet culture so well when they actively ship their own characters and turn them into their own turn ships of their characters into their own characters <laughs> oh yeah they knew what they were doing absolutely they they very much encouraged stuff like that um the crew the the, the unfortunate thing about steven universe is that because cartoon network split the seasons like season two and three were supposed to just be season two uh it means that steven universe had been on a backlog backlog for years and years and years so the crew really didn't have a chance to adapt to what the fandom was feeling even though they were interacting with the fandom and listening and all this stuff the story was already kind of set in stone for a long time, really. So the movie might be the first example of that, of it not being such a huge time gulf between it being finished and out. Um, but who knows? And I and I mean, like I will say, of all of the TV movies, all the ones we talked about with Cartoon Network, the Nickelodeon's ones we saw recently, this felt the most to me like a, like a movie, too. Like, Ed and Eddie felt like it as well. But Steven Universe absolutely felt like it just completely took everything a step up. The runtime is feature length. Like, there's no if ands, or buts about it, or no, like, with commercials, or it's a short movie. It is a movie. It is an hour-and-a-half movie. 
and I, I, I want to just applaud Cartoon Network for, for doing this because, yeah, it's not the most newcomer friendly series, but it is something that is artistic and powerful and meaningful to a lot of people. So giving them the budget and giving them the time and saying, yeah, let's do a TV movie that's very theatrical in nature I, I think it's a is a risk on Cartoon Network. It's something that Cartoon Network didn't have to do, and I don't know that they're going to get like a huge gain from it. But I do think they're going to get a gain from it, and they're definitely going to get more respect uh, because yeah, like stuff like this is is exactly what animation needs. Especially if the movies aren't going to give us, if the actual theaters aren't going to give us stuff like this, we need TV movies like this to right. provide us with with more longer form two D animation on on a higher budget than just a television show budget. Oh yeah. And, and I mean, even maturity wise, compared to the show, the movie is a little more mature in the sense that, I mean, it's got blood. That's, I think that maybe happens once in the show. Otherwise, if that. Oh, yeah, nose blood. Well, what's cool, what I like about it is that, you know, the whole time Spinel's fighting in her first fight scene and while Garnet's singing in the second one, it's all super cartoony. But then when Steven gets to the top and she says she doesn't want to play anymore, she just punches him. Like, it's not cartoon violence. It's just violence. And that's yeah. what causes Steven to bleed. And again, I feel like there's so many little details like that that, like, were so deliberate and intentional. And no matter how many, like, story gripes or continuity gripes or, like, whatever that I have, there was so much attention to detail that I enjoy every minute of this film. And and I, I guarantee you, I mean, already there's tons and tons of... We're, we're not hot on the bandwagon here. There's tons of people making videos. And I think... I think there can be tons of people making videos because there's so much to say and see with this movie. I'm honestly, I'm glad you at least somewhat enjoyed it, Monsters, because I, I really do think that this is something that, yes, obviously it helps being a fan of Steven Universe, but I think this is something that is artistic and beautiful in its own right that anyone can get something out of. I agree. It might not be for me, but I don't deny any sort of its artistic integrity at all. It's The songs are really good. I really appreciate the art. And I'm just really glad that Cartoon Network made it in the first place, or at least gave the Carnivores the opportunity to make it, because we really do need more things like this. All right. I don't have anything else. Yeah, I mean, I've pretty much said everything I need to say as well. So. Same here. All right. So, yeah, that's uh, that's Steven Universe the movie. I guess comparisons. <laughs> I'll I said all the I said all the comparisons. I, I like Steven Universe the, be the movie better than Say Uncle. Same here. Hot take, right? Same here. <laughs> All right, uh, viewer comments. We have one uh, at first from a guy named Crystal. They say, As someone who's been watching Steven Universe since it first aired in 2013 and has been a huge fan of it for many years, the movie exceeded my pretty high expectations. Even though there are only a few things I could have think I could think of that could have been handled better, such as the standard amnesia plot lines of the Crystal Gems and how the movie wraps up relatively quickly, everything else was fantastic. While most of the animation isn't that dissimilar to that of the show save for the two sequences animated by Takafumi Hori. I believe I pronounced that correctly. I could be wrong. Uh, the backgrounds, color palette, and art are a great step up from the show. So much of the music is outstanding and some of the best ever produced for the series. I also believe Spinell is the best Steven Universe villain, as her backstory and actions are much more tragic than uh, most villains in, in shows like Steven Universe are written and play into the film's themes of change as well. If there weren't already more seasons for Steven Universe in production, I would be more than content if this movie was the ending for the show. I truly cannot express my love for it enough. And as for, say, Uncle, it's fine, I guess. I'm not really a fan of Uncle Grandpa's humor, as I believe so much of the weirdness of the show is too downplayed for me to find it funny, so most of that humor in the episode didn't land with me. The only thing in the episode that makes me laugh is the portrayal of the gems, as they are so over-exaggerated that it is a joy to watch. Yeah, that's a fair take, I'd say. Yeah. I agree with most of that, not all of it, but yeah. And we also have one from... Kirby over yonder, <clears throat> who says, Truly, Say Uncle is the epitome of the animated entertainment. Step aside Avatar, Samurai Jack, Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, Bojack Horseman, etc. With its sense of nuance, subtlety, and beauty, Say Uncle manages to touch me in ways those other cartoons couldn't dream of. Anyone who can't appreciate it clearly has no respect for the animation industry and shall never eat lunch in my town again. Thanks for listening to my TED Talk. Well said. I and agree. In case my tone didn't make that clear, Kirby over yonder was joking. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it looks like we also have one from uh, Christian Goken. 
who says, Say Uncle is a really funny episode of Steven Universe, in my opinion. The show's humor just seems to work with Steven Universe for some reason, and the exaggerated nature of Uncle Grandpa doesn't seem too out of place. It actually is one of my favorite episodes of the show, and it's the only comedic-centric episode that's funny, IMO. And personally, I gotta kind of agree with that. There are <laughs> some episodes that can that are kind of funny. The t-shirt cannon one is, but yeah. Monsters, you got trivia? I do have trivia. Ooh. All right. So uh, I love the tag team dynamic that we've been doing in the past few episodes, so we're going to bring that back. So we're a team, Shadow. Oh, okay. Got to talk through our problems like Steven Universe. All right. Sounds like a plan. (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) Very well said. So you guys are teaming up. Uh, I'm going to name a song from Steven Universe, and you have to tell me the episode it came from. So yeah, are you ready? Yeah. All right. Let's go to prompt number one. And the song is called... Let me drive my van, parentheses, into your heart. <laughs> That's a good this one. is from Laser Light Cannon. That is correct. Uh, Laser Light Cannon, I also would have accepted uh, Steven's birthday and Change Your Mind, in which it was performed by someone else different than Greg. Perfect. All right. One point is on the board. Good job, Shadow. You really... <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this right now. I don't know that many of us are titles. I can tell you what happens in them. But I don't know the title. This right. might That's be all right. you. You can help. You can help. It's okay. <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, bud. All right. And with that, let's move on to the second prompt. Here comes a thought. <laughs> Why did you say it like... N- never mind. Um, <laughs> I, I understand, but yeah. Mindful education. Final answer. I agree. That is correct. It is the fourth episode of season four, and it was performed by Garnet and Stevani. Uh, Ali Mashaka, I believe I want to say. Yeah, from Ali and, uh, Ali and AJ. Well, she's also a person, but yes. Yeah, and from <laughs> Phil of the Future. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, really? Yeah, she played the girl from Phil of the Future. Oh, yeah, that's my favorite character. And she was also from the DCOM Cowbells. All right, I'm just going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Two points on the board. Let's move on to number three. The song is Big Fat Zucchini. I thought the song was Big Fat Me Zucchini. That episode uh, is Steven and the Stevens, which is the time travel episode that I referenced before. But it's not really a time travel episode. It's just a a time duplicate episode, kind of. It's weird. Well, yeah, that's that's correct. It's performed by Steven and the Stevens. It's from season one towards the end of it, I believe. Fun fact, Me Zucchini is like the worst song in the entire show. I picked that because the name. It's just like, yeah, Zucchini. What? It's, uh, It's Screamo of Steven calling steven a big fat mini zucchini yeah Perfect. he's gonna yeah. Ch- he's gonna chop him up chop chop him up and serve him with linguine somehow this made it onto the steven universe soundtrack <laughs> beautiful man there yeah. are th- listen there are things like the uh the big donut like training video song that didn't make it on the soundtrack but big fat mini zucchini gotta be on there sounds like it all right three for three Monsters, are, are you a big fat mini zucchini? Uh, in some eyes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you didn't like what Monsters had to say about Ruby and Sapphire, call him a big fat mini zucchini down in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like the anti spinel. <laughs> All right, perfect. Three for three. Let's move on to number four. We got the song Ruby Rider. Ruby Rider. Uh, that's, so I want to say it's the question. Shadow, any thoughts? I don't know the name. I have no idea what the name could be. I know it's where Ruby's a cow person. Ruby's a cow? Cow gem. A cow gem. <laughs> Actually, well, Amethyst is a horse in that episode, so... That's also true. <laughs> so, yeah, it's 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 the question. Is that your final answer? Yes. It's the question. My uh, answer to the question is... My answer to the question is the question. And your the question is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and the the answer is love. <laughs> yes Stephen, it is um yeah sang by ruby uh from season five it's a country song so i know how many people out here love country music it's another one of my least favorites in the show <laughs> you're hitting them you're hitting them monsters <laughs> that was that was my goal i think so four for four let's see if i can trick you with the last one number five Uh-oh. uh well, instrumental right. music <laughs> <laughs> all right this one is called I think I need a little parentheses change. I think I need a little che eh, change. That is from one of the best episodes. It is an episode about Greg Universe figuring out that he can't just be a bum all day hanging around Rose Courts and he needs to get a job and be like a normal person. 
Oh shoot, which flashback is that? That that's the one where they babysit sour cream, right? Shadow. Help me out on this. I I can tell you the name probably if you give me the. Nope. Mm, I I don't remember. <laughs> This song never stuck with me. Oh, it's a great song. It's just, yeah, I want to say it's that episode, and that episode is called. Uh oh, you might have me on the last one. <laughs> this one, it's not three gems and a baby. That's the that's the last flashback episode, and that's after Rose is gone. This episode is called Greg's Big Chain. No, um, uh. Ch-ch-ch-changes. I wish I could be more help, but I don't know Steven Universe titles. Uh, <laughs> I just don't. Greg's... I need a final answer. This is uh, this is uh, Greg the Babysitter. Is that your final answer? Yes, I got it. That is correct. Woo! Pulled right. it out at the last five minute. for five. Shadow, you killed it, man. Thanks. <laughs> I, I was I was emotional support. <laughs> yep. Hi, guy. I think your your performance could be a little bit better next time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could have come up with that title a lot sooner if Shadow wasn't here distracting me. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> distracting you? I'm barely saying anything. <laughs> distracting me by your lack of presence. Oh, okay. Who are you, Rose Quartz? <laughs> oh. I'm joking. Next week on the recast, we're going back to my favorite cartoon. Teen Titans Go? Bojack Horseman. And we are going to be talking about the episodes Downer Ending and That's Too Much, Man. These are both Bojack and Sarah Lynn-centric episodes where they both partake in a bunch of illicit substances and do a bunch of crazy, wacky stuff that ends in sad. And uh, Downer Ending is the penultimate episode of the first season. That's Too Much, Man is the penultimate episode of the third season. Sounds like my type of episodes. Yeah, penultimate. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's a good word yeah all right well thank you again shadow for Thanks, being shadow. on the recast yeah thank you it's always a pleasure anytime monsters thank you for putting up with us talking about steven universe don't worry i have to do it all the time with other people <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking well, you, i'm joking suggest another camp laszlo or a regular show episode and we can we can roll reserve for roll reversal it up don't forget love is the answer it is, though, monsters. Why do you hate love? Uh, Pie Guy rules out. <laughs> Bye. Love is blind. <laughs>